uh, the Anthologies Community of Practice has launched this year in 2020 two new webinar uh, series. Uh, one will be to introduce the product of our community of practice because we have active members producing semantic tools ontologies. And this uh, particular series, which is called How Agroindustry Uses Ontologies, and of course, beyond that, the semantic tools. So this series will be composed of two or three webinars. Uh, we will be inviting colleagues from different companies. This first um, webinar uh, was uh, selected in order to echo the last webinar we held in 2019 about knowledge graph in general. Uh, in fact, we realized that Eric and Jens have uh, worked on applying semantic tools and particularly knowledge graph to uh, crop data. So this is of direct interest to our community. It's quite a, a unique example of this type of application. Then I will leave the floor to Eric Antezana, who is a senior scientist at uh, Bayer Crop Science. Thank you very much. Thank you especially to Celine and Elizabeth for the invitation so that we could share, as, as you mentioned, a little bit of our activities within the company. And uh, I hope, let's say, this, this will open also discussions and also some feedback from you guys in the call so that we could continue also improving what we have. Because at the end, let's say, what we internally have in the company, it's also a sort of, to some extent, let's say, an inspiration of what has been happening, let's say, in external organizations. I mean, external to, to buyer, in particular, let's say, academic and research institutes or initiatives like uh, the Research Data Alliance and other ones too. Okay, so I'm going to talk about yeah, semantic web and in particular about ontologies and how they how they have been benefiting the activities we have been doing within the company. But before actually jumping into the the, the, the topic itself of of, uh, of the ontologies, I'm going to give you a, a couple of slides, a few words about what we do in the company, so that you could know what type of activities we are also involved. So within this this pyramid that you can see on your screen. In the middle, you can see there are three major pillars on which the company has been working since more or less, let's say, many years ago. Actually, the company is more than 150 years old. And there you can see the major activities that the company has been busy with. On the left-hand side, you can see that the company is not only about crop science, but it's also mainly about pharmaceuticals. In the middle, you can see the, the central pillar about consumer health and how, let's say, our colleagues in that area are supporting the activities to improve the health of people, but also actually of certain animals. And, uh, and last but not least is the pillar about crop science. And this is the pillar on which Jens and myself belong to. And where, let's say, we are going to, sh to show and discuss a little bit of what we, we, what we have been doing within the company. So here you can see that within crop science, the company has been, let's say, focusing on four different business areas, as we call them. On the left-hand side, you can see that the first one is around chemicals and biological crop protection products, actually. Second one is around all what, let's say, the products are on seeds and trades, so improvement of yield, for instance, or improvement of the quality of, of certain crops. Next to, it, next to it, you can also see and read uh, a major business area which is around digital technologies and services that are nowadays very very popular not only in industry but also in academia around let's say what are the digitalization efforts that are let's say uh, improving the way on how we operate and last but not least is an important business area around environmental science and how let's say the products and let's say the things that the, the company is producing and selling are, are environmentally com compliant, let's say, and also uh, say supporting the, the, the activities that are around all, all, yeah, not only research, but also, let's say, final users of, of these kind of products. So in the next slide, there is, well, it's a very, very packed slide, but please just focus on the circles that are in the middle of the slide. There you can see the, the air business areas that I just mentioned, a couple of them like seeds and trades, but also the second one, crop protection. I wanted to highlight within this slide, I'm not going to go into the detail of all the numbers and figures that are below all of them, but just focus on, let's say, the activities that we, we our teams especially are focusing. The first one is around breeding. 
because if this is one of the most important activities in our in our crop science area plant biotech and biotech in general it's also a second one which is not only producing quite a uh, quite large, let's say, amounts of data, but interesting, interesting things on which our data scientists are working. Of course, all this has to be connected and plugged to our crop, crop protection activities, which is around chemistry, biologics, and these kind of things. So let me continue then now straight into the main aspects of this, uh, of this uh, uh, presentation. The first let, let me start then with, uh, after let's say this introduction of the company, with the motivation that let's say led us to jump or to work with, with ontology and with this kind of technologies in the company. The first one is let's say the importance of let's say realizing that to some extent the knowledge representation has to be reviewed on, on the activities that we have in the company. This is, is, this is of course in connection to the data management a larger data management strategy and activities that we had. The point was that we realized that certain activities, uh, like for instance, traditional uh, systems were failing to deal with new requirements. In, in particular, when we were talking about big data, for instance, you, there you can see that I, I pointed out about the Vs, the famous Vs, like for instance, volume and uh, uh, velocity and these kind of things. One of the important aspects around this is about the data integration, uh, which is actually a limiting factor and has been a limiting factor for most of our data scientists because they, they've been spending quite some time about, about an estimation of between 50 and 80% of their time just massaging the data because they had to, let's say, re reformat the data, reintegrate the data, connect columns from one, from here to there, et cetera, and these kind of things. And of course, there was also a parallel activity about re the implementation of tools, which also typically in, uh, involves the reformatting of the data. And on top of this, and let's say to complicate a bit more the things, the other common problem is the, the classical identity crisis, where let's say we, we are receiving certain pieces of data that typically has some IDs, some data entries for the, our data objects, and normally every data scientist is creating new ideas and this is of course complicating the space of ideas so all let's say all those points uh, were let's say sort of asking for a new way of uh, of dealing with with the knowledge representation and data management in in general so the answer our answer to this this kind of problematic was to introduce and to try to exploit ontologies as well as semantic web technologies. I put there, perhaps you have noticed already that this is par a partial answer because we are not only relying on this kind of technologies, although let's say within our core activities, especially within my team, this is what we do. So a quick review of how we are dealing with the, this data strategy and how why let's say ontologies are important in what we are doing if we start in the at the bottom of this image you can see in the blue box in the blue large box let's say there are two important components one it's, it's, it's the, are the ontologies well in, actually in within this box we can also put taxonomies and control vocabularies and in general the, the, the terminology that, that we are making use of and another, another second ingredient let's say for coming up to uh, let's say uh, sustainable data integration are the selection of the data assets so what are the data assets are the important let's say and relevant pieces of data that are making us that are let's say improving or adding extra added value to uh, the data sets that we already have within the company so all these are enabling let's say a proper and sustainable data integration which at some point where it's also generating knowledge and this is something on where Jens is going to, to, to talk more a little bit later on. And thanks to this knowledge, we can bring to our scientists better insights of what is happening, not only at molecular levels, at experimental levels, and I mean, at different levels of, on which we are supporting our data. And this is in turn driving innovation, which of course is putting our company, our compa company in a more, in a better position, in a more competitive position, let's say. So this is, let's say, our strategy on how we are dealing or how we are positioning ontologies within this entire pipeline. Now, I've been talking about data, but in, in particular, 
let's let me let's say make some precisions about what type of data we are dealing with there on on the right hand side you can see some nice images about the type of data that we are dealing with within the company this is just a sample let's say there are also other types of data but you can see the major pieces that we are dealing with like for instance field trial data and again Jens is going to to give a couple of examples very interesting examples around exercises around this data there are also climate and environmental data of course, we also have meta and omics data. Chemical data is, of course, an, another important point, as well as phenotyping data. And what's the challenge around all those different pieces? First of all, the integration of, of all, all of them, or I mean, when it's, of course, relevant, because all of them, as you must, might, might know, must know, they are very, very different, or let's say they are not only expressed in, in let's say, in different formats, but also they are following different ways of, of, let's say, getting integrated into the different technologies that we have. So the challenge then again is to, to try to describe and organize this biological data using better approaches. Yeah. So of course, this, this has to, ca to come hand in hand with, uh, with, with the development of tools and interfaces so that we could maximize the exploitation of the resources that are available. So that again, if you re remember the previous slide, we could have, let's say, better innovative solutions and knowledge discovered to what we have. And last but not least, of course, taking into account the performance and, let's say, the scalability of our systems. So now let me make a stop about ontology. I wanted, I mean, as the, this, this, um, this, let's say, a specific group of, let's say, you guys are working, uh, I believe, on these kind of topics, I wanted to give to give you the, the view of what we typically use uh, in terms of the definition of an ontology. So in very, very general terms, when we are, let's say, approaching users, we are, let's say, sort of transforming or translating the, the scary word of ontology for to some of the people that are, let's say, in our, in our business as a simple categorization. So that has been, let's say, one of the selling points so that, let's say, not only we could get much more users but also let's say what we could get acceptance of what we are doing because you know i guess some of you will also share the similar experiences around what how difficult it is to sometimes convey the message of why ontologies are useful and what they actually mean but let's say for the specialist of course within our company and especially for the team i belong to in, in general, uh, an ontology is a formal specification of the domain. So basically what we are collecting as, uh, or what we, when we build ontology, or when I say an ontology, it's a collection of terms, the relations, and of course the meaning behind those terms and relationships. Of course, we use the word by ontology to, let's say, refer to these kind of entities. How we are using them, again, to share information, standardize, and standardize the terminology that we use so that, let's say, people could not only share data, compare data, reproduce experiments, go back to, let's say, the different uh, data sets that they have already produced in the past. And of course, to support the data integration within our activities. I put a screenshot of, of a little piece of the uh, trait ontology that I'm, I'm sure is pretty familiar to most of you. So that there you can see, of course, that there are, let's say, the terms, different relationships, and of course, behind of all of them, there are some definitions. So, but we are not only dealing with actually with ontologies within the company. As you can see, we are also dealing with their relatives, as we call them. So there you can see in the middle of this uh, half cake, let's say, we also have simpler structures, like for instance, dictionaries, controlled vocabularies, taxonomies, and these kind of things. On the right hand side, you can see that the, at the bottom level, let's say, we are dealing with let's say less complex structures, pieces of data, and as as long as we let's say get let's say separated or far from the middle of this half cake of course we are going to be ending up with uh, a bit more complex structures that on the one hand are going to let's say bring us much more opportunities but also better ways to to formalize the knowledge that we have so that that was let's say again an introduction or so that you could see how we are dealing with these kind of things and how what do you what, how do we call them so in terms of what ontologies we use, there you can see in this uh, screenshot, oh, sorry, in this uh, slide, that we are not reinventing, of course, the wheel, because there are, as you, most of you probably know, there are plenty of teams that have been busy for years already in building quite nice and, let's say, resources around, the, let's say, typical activities that are relevant, for instance, in the agricultural business. 
I, I, I'm highlighting a few of them, of course, this is not a complete list of what we have and what is also available outside, but there you can see a couple of, I mean, a few clusters, like for instance, a cluster about the sequence domain, let's say, a cluster around a species, where there you can see, for instance, in the classical NCBI taxonomy, Mycobank, which is another very interesting resource to deal when we are dealing with uh, certain pathogens, EPPO, which corresponds to the European Plant Protection Organization taxonomy. This is another very important one, especially for industry, because this is the one that our regulators our, or our authorities require when they, when we are, let's say, uh, filing uh, applications for certain products and these kind of things. And you can, of course, also not, uh, identify other very popular ontologies like, I don't know, the trait ontology, gene ontology, et cetera, et cetera. The ones that are highlighted in orange are actually the ones which are part of our current platform. Of course, our current platform is still in, in, in current, in, in constant, let's say, construction. So many of the ones which are, let's say, in, in, in black, not in orange, are going to be part at some point more of, of, of our uh, platform. On the other hand, we are also using ontologies that are not only relevant for agriculture, and I'm sure that in perhaps you guys and in some projects or in some say, data sets, databases, you are also making use of another in interesting and relevant um, uh, pieces of, let's say, data or ontologies, such as, for instance, the, the uh, units of measurement ontology, such as, I don't know, uh, an ontology for methods on data, evidence codes, and these kind of things. Again, the ones that are in orange are the ones who are, which are part of our platform. There is one particular one, which is in, in this cluster around locations, which is an, in, an internal ontology. It's the buyer locations ontology, which holds, let's say, information around the buyer locations. This is relevant because, you know, the company has different, uh, is, is present in different countries around the world, but also not only at, at administrative level, but also, let's say, at an operational level in the sense that we have, let's say, we need to re register where we have where we have our field trials and our, let's say, centers of operations and these kind of things. This is another very important ontology for our case, where you, as I guess you must, uh, uh, as, uh, get, you must guess that in this ontology, there are countries, for instance, cities, villages, and these kind of entities, of course. So, now, going in a little bit into the detail of the platform that we built, there you can see that this, this platform actually has quite a few features, or as we call them. Starting in the top, we, we, you can see that the, in, in, the, in this red uh, um, figure that we have, let's not only, we are not only storing external data standards, as, as the ones that you have seen previously, but also internal standards, because the company, you know, has also internal data that needs to be, let's say, standardized, and in particular about the terminology that are, let's say, very, uh, very popular across divisions. That's one of our strategies, actually, to work on, on, on terminologies that are rele relevant, not only for one single team or one single person, let's say, but also important for many other people. This ontology platform we have is also able to deal with different types of data representations. I already mentioned that we are not only dealing with ontologies, but also taxonomies and simple lists. We have on top of this a data governance component, let's say, which is, let's say, the one that is helping us or supporting our activities around uh, say not only spreading, let's say, or communicating what we have in terms of the platform, but also around how the data has to be curated, the policies around them, the roles about, for instance, stewardship and this kind of thing. This is a, another larger initiative that we have. The next one is about FAIR. I don't think I need to talk too much about this because I'm, I'm sure that you all know what FAIR means, but yeah, just to say that our platform is, of course, supporting. I mean, it's on the one hand side FAIR as, as in, in the measure that we can have it, of course, but also is enabling other data sets within the company to become FAIR. Next one is around the enterprise readiness. So this means that the, on the platform we have is also, let's say, supported at a global or corporate level. So this means that there are not, it's not only serving a, a few guys in a corner, but it's, let's say, serving a, a, quite some people across the globe. And well, let's say we need to ensure, of course, that uh, the, the services are running 24 hours over seven. And last but not, but not least is around the interfaces where we have let's say, different options to consume our data, REST services, SparkQL, and the classical things we have. So just a, you, you can read a few figures on the right-hand side. We have around 226 graphs. 
2.5, approximately 2.5 million triples. We are using Virtuoso, although I put also Oracle in, in, in uh, parentheses because we have also certain pieces that we, for legacy applications that are, let's say, still stored in, in this kind of traditional, let's say, way of, of storing data. And we have, of course, different users that are consuming our, our data. Uh, next one is about um, yeah as, as this let's say community um, uh, uh, is is let's say focus on ontology. I wanted to also let you know a little bit of how we are let's say maintaining our resources. So, so as you can read there, there are basically three different three different processes A, B, C, and it it actually it's pretty simple because it means that let's say process A will be for the most simple types of of structures let's say and process C for the most complex which are let's say ontologies. How this is happening uh, at some point is you will see in the next slides, but you will see that you can see also on the right hand side how we are making I mean why we are for instance identifying new terms or uh, adding new terms in in our in our platform there you can see that we are of course starting defining the scope if we need to see whether there is already an available uh, uh, resource outside if whether somebody has already identified as an ontology or an a taxonomy for for this kind of problem for instance we are start we start collecting or gathering the terms we start categorize them and then of course we at some point we might need a visual representation because this is much easier to discuss with of course with the expert because you know they have to be involved in these kind of discussions of course there has to be some management of the terms we need to see how they are going to be maintained what kind of attributes they are going to have what kind of properties and we need to be able of course to export terms and to perhaps of course already load them into the platform there will be processes around the governance to validate review the quality completion of the data and of course this will end up in our repository at some point so this is roughly how this how this is happening of course, the maintenance also depends on plenty of other variables. There, I, I was able to collect a few, well, quite some, quite some of, of the ones that are, let's say, making a, a, or helping us to 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 take decisions. Like, for instance, what type of resource is it? I already mentioned a little bit about this. Is this a public or a private resource that we have in the in the platform? Are, are we talking about new entries and new synonyms, new codes? Another important one is, is around uh, requirements because you know this has to be linked to the business questions that are at some point of course translated into competency questions. Another important aspect is about of course the coverage. So is this a new, a totally new domain that we're talking about, or are there other people that are already that that already produce this kind of ontology or taxonomy? Of course, we need to discuss, review priorities, and we need to draw like a roadmap where we can see, for instance, whether we are going to have like a fast integration, regular updates, or these kind of things. For all of these, of course, we have like different processes. Depending, of course, on the complexity of the, of the domain, we might end up with some controversial terms. I'm sure most of you or some of you also know that this, sometimes we can dis have discussions just for in, around one single term for days, weeks, and etc. So this can be another, let's say, problematic aspect in terms of the maintenance and the further development of ontologies. Of course, the technical component is pretty important. Are we go, is this going to be end up ending up in our graph-based systems or virtuoso or our relational database? We need to also be dealing with, let's say, the data status of, let's say, the different steps on how we are maintaining our data. Is this a draft? Is this already accepted by the people, by the stewards, or is this a retired term? So these kind of things we have to take into account. I also wanted to compile and, and, and let's say this present to you the challenges that are typically present from the user's point of view. I already mentioned that we 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 yes we have like a sort of a very simplified definition of an, an ontology, let's say a simple categorization. So this has been helping us, as I mentioned, to to get closer to the users. Of course, they are also interested in knowing how they could consume these kind of things, how many options they have. Are, is it only through SparkQL? Can they use other kind of services? Are there web interfaces and these kind of things? They, it's also important to keep in mind, of course, who is the responsible of the ontology. There has to be a name behind it. Does this ontology have an internal data? How is it aligned with other ones? Who is behind it? How do I map my, my, my data with ontology terms? I mean, there is there is a long list. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just wanted to compile that there are challenges around, let's say, the introduction of these kind of things. 
we've been busy in the company for more than 10 years with this kind of technologies and i will i will tell you that in certain areas the battle is has been i mean we've been winning let's say but in certain areas let's say we have to still work let's say in, in terms of standardizing our data and our our let's say databases so what are actually the challenges from our point of view i mean from our side the people that are called either ontologists or let's say knowledge engineers or the people who are behind let's say these kind of platforms one and the most important is either to convince let's say or to convey people the message that they need to comply to a specific language of course if this is done you have to be careful because you need to you might end up being let's say victim a victim of, of the success which in some cases that was our case and of course this is this has a pretty high impact on the resources that that we have in the team collection of requirements is an important step also from the side of the ontologies because again this is translated in competency questions that are not only helping us to validate what we have in the system but also to let's say verify what we have to, uh, to a higher quality. There are several too many, like in terms of, for instance, there are too many preferred names. Sometimes one group prefers, of course, one name and in contrast to a different group. There are, of course, also too many stakeholders that are, for instance, just interested in specific domains like species. Too many important codes, because what is important for me might be not important for you. So, it, and this is not only for codes, it could be for abbreviation, IDs, and these other kind of things. Sometimes it could also be difficult to define a minimal set of metadata for a domain. So as you can see, I, I mean, I'm, I tried to list a couple of the things that, let's say, we've been experiencing on, on the last, let's say, 10 or so years within the company when we've been trying to work on these kind of domains. I'm pretty sure that some of you are pretty familiar and you have been facing similar topics too. You will be interested to perhaps also listen to, to let's say, your experience in these kind of things. So a topic a concept that was born uh, by some people some time ago was around uh, it's it's around let's say the combination of semantics for agriculture so there you can see that it, this is basically what yeah that is supporting our activities around the common language that you can see three guys that are talking about let's say the same entity at the end but they are using actually different entities uh, different terms sorry so this is, of course, this is not a, a concept that we created ourselves, but uh, let's say we adopted because we believe in these kind of things. And uh, uh, several people around in, in the call, like Elizabeth, for instance, are involved in these kind of things. Uh, so just let me fi finalize with some lesson, some more lessons learned. So I mentioned some of them are a sort of repetition. So and perhaps also uh, very well known to all of you, like for instance, the first one that you know transforming into rdf certain type of data is not only a consuming task but it's also perhaps not necessary sometimes it's important to have trade-offs in between let's say generic and specific services how they are going to be consumed agile development is also an important aspect that needs to be taken into account it's interesting of course to take part uh, yeah the interesting part of it's also the analytics that this shouldn't come later we need to protect let's say the users from complex and technical components. That's also something I think I also mentioned very quickly. And okay, and then uh, there are, maybe I will jump to the last one. This is another important one that data evolution must be considered from the beginning of the project or let's say the type of activity that you want to cover with this kind of activities. There are plenty of external initiatives. I am pretty sure that you are, uh, aware of many of them. We are following all several of these things that you can perhaps recognize your institution, but we are following and learning from all of them, as you can see. This list is again, not complete. There are perhaps, I'm, I'm, I'm missing some of the entries that we are also following there. Another, and one important box is the universities because yeah, we connect also with some people in, at the University of Academics. So let me finalize just acknowledging the people in the team, all the people that have been working, our users, and of course, our external collaborators. And with this, I think I'm ready. I'm sorry if I took a bit more of time. Thank you for the great presentation. I think it's quite a complex space and, and those graphs and the slides were really clear. So thank you for that. So Jens Hollander will also continue now on this topic and you're a senior data scientist at Bayer Crop Science as well. Yes, also thank you. And thank you the organizers for the invitation. So yes, we are using uh, on uh, knowledge graphs and semantics 
plus the corresponding link technologies in several projects and you have seen the ontology platform presented by Eric is one of the examples and I would like to use here the opportunity to speak about knowledge graphs enabling exploration and discovery. So let's take a short uh, uh, look into the background and the motivation behind this. If it's working, yes. To present our, uh, our uh, semantic approach, I will focus on field trials as a use case. As Eric mentioned in the ACO uh, semantic space, especially on research and development, so on R&D trials, which are supporting our product development. Generally, uh, trial experiments can be performed using the following, but in quote, simplified sketch uh, process. So we are starting with planning and placing a trial. Afterwards, we have field operations such as planting and treatments. So generally any kind of field management during each trial experiment, monitoring and different assessments are performed for crop yield um, and or uh, efficacy. And at the end of a trial, the final data or uh, specifically the final assessment are used for statistically analytics, reporting and decision making if we should continue or not to continue. So to develop a product for farming, this process runs continuously along the R&D pipeline. As you can see here through the different stages on the bottom from the scoping to research to development to market. And in summary, we performing a number of or a big number of trials, whereas some trials are performed over different years. Some run in labs or greenhouses, but here mainly at the beginning of this pipeline. Others are in the field with different parameters such as location and in environmental conditions. We have research trials, regulatory trials, which are have to hand it over to authorities, marketing trials and so on. So you can imagine that this is a complex uh, process and during the performance of all these trials along the R&D pipeline. Um, these data are generated and collected based on the business function in charge and based on the project goals and will might be even result in different data resources. So that's for instance, to deal with historical data and here we are speaking about 30 plus years, it is hard to timely get a combined view on all the data based on the data capturing in the past, as well as uh, uh, several activities around data wrangling and uh, down manipulating the data, analyzing data are done multiple times. So using linked data principles, we developed and proposed a semantic architecture that lifts the selected primary data resources into a knowledge graph to solve these interoperability issues um, and to try to provide timely and consistently labeled data to domain experts, as well as to our analysts and helping them in making more informed decision, as well as of course, to avoid duplicated efforts. So in the pipeline, our first step uh, is to the, is the data lifting and augmentation, where the data are, is harmonized and mapped against a cross-domain data model to build a knowledge graph. And on this way, the data will be completed, corrected, and enriched using internal and external uh, data resulting in different knowledge representation and different technologies. And uh, we will also, and there we're also using the ontology platform Eric mentioned. In the second step, uh, this knowledge representation is used to do digital uh, experimentation, for instance, to apply computational approaches and to build minimal viable products in an iterative fashion or approach. In the third step, the results and corresponding validation, interpretations um, uh, and reports are used to communicate and to support the decision making. In this talk, I will focus mainly or speak about the semantic lifting approach, as well as I have some slides uh, um, for a field trial use cases uh, coming with some applications where we're using the generated uh, knowledge representation. So let's take a closer look in the semantic lifting approach. <clears throat> the general approach consists in lifting the data from the individual selected data sources which we also might be even silos um, uh, in, in, in different setups into a knowledge representation or knowledge graph guided by a semantic cross-domain data model 
we are reusing identifiers from predefined shared vocabularies and ontologies consumed from the ontology platform mentioned by Eric, as well as we enrich the knowledge graph uh, using terminology mappings uh, uh, across different data sets. Our semantic uh, uh, lifting pipeline is embedded in our end-to-end -end technology stack, and it's composed, as you can see here, of producers, transformers, and consumers. Um, within a corresponding data layer. So the la data layer contains a variety of distinct components according to the requested user requirements, and it's connected to the application layer through a service layer. So uh, we will now dive a little bit deeper into the elements, but at first uh, what we need, of course, is data. And to support field trial, the, the support these field trial use cases, you need several type of data sets, about your project, about the planning, the equipment, environment information, including weather and soil conditions. Of course, also your experiment uh, itself, ex uh, assessments, which are coming from different devices, information about crop and targets, and so on and so on. So all these data are targeted and feed it into, into our pipeline. The first part of the semantic pipeline is ingesting of the relevant and selected data you have seen to incorporate this into our knowledge graph. We developed various source connectors speaking the native language of each of the, of the sources. And uh, you can see here an abstract data model, which is experiment centric, specifically to answer the question around, uh, uh, about these uh, field trials and uh, where this, these data will be mapped onto. It organizes the element of the data and defines how they are related to each other. And you can see this as a kind of uh, common meta uh, schema concept uh, of the domain, which can be linked to a uh, top level ontology. During the mapping process, some generic data processing steps are done, which are needed to fit to these defined uh, domain model. Consistency and formatting issues are reported back to the data owner for correcting, correcting uh, them on their side. So finally, if the data are mapped onto the data model, the transformers take over. So the current data model, as you can see here, can be sliced into uh, five domains or type of concepts. Uh, as you see here, we have a geospatial, uh, chemistry, biology, um, experimental setup uh, and, and uh, provenance domain. The provenance captures the project supports and process information, which enables the uh, traceability and data availability along the R&D pipeline. Each of these domains have their own rules and set of ontologies and control vocabularies. So this step in the workflow requires and enforcing control vocabularies and corresponding data adaptation using uh, consistent and persistent identifiers across sources and domain rules. For instance, in the geospatial domain, all these entities you see here should be have a geo coordinates as one of, uh, as one of the extra common uh, denominators allowing to map geo geospatial features. So generally, the internal ontology platform, which was mentioned by Eric, is the key element for the final data model you see here. It hosted our ontologies, control vocabularies, hierarchies, and our mappings for the relevant domain uh, knowledge and terminology concepts. It's basically our primary resource, and it's heavily used during the lifting process. What we also learned is having such an ontology platform and maintaining such a reference database enables trust and makes uh, data integration easier for our data assets across the organization, as well as it also allows better versioning and traceability for knowledge representation management. <clears throat> Besides this point, we also uh, make use of external and internal extra data sources to get our data right or in the right shape. So, for instance, we are using geonames to impute uh, to, uh, um, and to correct historical data uh, which are missing uh, GPS coordinates, or only using placeholders such as postal code or city names in any forms you can think of. 
So GPS coordinates, as mentioned earlier, are a prerequisite to obtain correctly mapped and modeled environmental factors such as soil, weather and climate details. We also have enabled a way to add new uh, sensor-based data which, uh, which are mounted, uh, for instance, on farm equipment, which we currently tested and not in production yet or not on the production pipeline yet. And the nice thing here is we don't have to change the underlying graph or schema to ingest or to digest these data. Additionally, we're also looking in providing information to authorities for submission activities. And here we have guidelines how to run experiments, as well as provided structured templates with terminology pick lists. For instance, the OECD harmonized templates. Um, and in times of digitalization and transformation, uh, uh, these kind of activities enables to move from a paper-centric way of working to a data-centric way of working. Uh, but here we still have uh, some homeworks uh, to do here. At the end of the workflow, the data is aggregated into a knowledge graph layer uh, with contextual meaning and established connection to other related data. Um, we have different views and representation for our users, which makes the data and the knowledge easily searchable, analyzable, and reusable as well as it also allows us to in inspect our data, to find data inconsistency and quality gaps as early as possible. And uh, in this case, also before it's, uh, so we can correct and fix those data issues before they get uh, propagated into the data analytics and follow-up activities. We integrated more than uh, 500,000 field tries collected over the last 30 years. The developed consumers provide a suite of metadata to access these knowledge graph representation by providing multiple formats of various, uh, for various applications and usage, such as we have search index in Elasticsearch, enabling semantic searching. We have graph structures stored in Virtuoso and Neo4j. We have file-based persistence for some data assets in MongoDB. We're using JSON-LD as exchange format. Um, as, as well as Eric also mentioned, some data are, are also still in relational databases. All these is exposed via APIs using GraphQL and REST services to allow a kind of self-service uh, 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 self service to build applications. At the same time, also these APIs can be used by data scientists to refresh the analytic toolboxes with the most up-to-date and semantically enriched data and thereby we support them uh, in analytic in, in the analytics and as well as to build new data models. Additionally, at any time, uh, we can create new consumers um, um, without affecting the underlying uh, uh, corporate knowledge graph. Um, and now I would like to go shortly in some applications where we're directly using these knowledge graph. One application here you see here uh, on top of the pipeline is the trial finder to make uh, use of the search index and the knowledge graph itself, allowing to search for specific information of interest. As you can see, having an auto completion and a digestion functionality, it shows in a summarized way the experimental data. If you select certain trials, uh, additional information are seamlessly loaded such as soil information or weather information through third parties or to, to other services for the experiment based on the parameters uh, um, uh, on the fly extracted from the knowledge graph. When you have selected a, a set of trials, you can push this information into other applications, which enables you to visualize uh, uh, your results and to also enable visual analytics capabilities. In this case, the selected data are pushed into a Spotfire dashboard. And here you can see a field with different plots with mapped sensor measurements. And you can visually inspect the behavior of certain parameters, as well as you can perform your statistics and analysis on the data. Also, these kind of dashboards are a fruitful way to present results to our stakeholders, which are basically outside our data science community. In some cases, you have discovered some interesting behavior or you have uh, uh, discovered uh, some behaviors you don't understand. 
And for this, we are using directly uh, learning approaches on the graph to find pattern as well as to try to explain certain pattern. So for instance, the knowledge graph is then the basis for creating a feature matrix, which then trains the selected algorithm. Furthermore, we are using the different knowledge graph representations for creating new predictive modeling or models and helping in making more info to inform, uh, informed decisions about field operations and working, uh, and working uh, uh, with the goal uh, for, more res uh, for more resource efficiency. So such as optimal uh, uh, water usage in cropping, for instance. Coming to the conclusion and the summary. So uh, the knowledge is represented in the, in the context that reflects a consistent view across the organization, specifically here for the field trials. It's allowing abstractions, aggregation, and contextually comparison that were previously not or hardly feasible. The different elements of the data pipeline are reusable to provide a custom way uh, or a custom pipeline and expose this uh, via APIs to enable improved way of working for, for everybody. Data inconsistency and also especially data quality gaps can be discovered and fixed early enough um, in our data integration layer and will not uh, propagate to the downstream analytics. The approach supports advanced data analytics and facilitates a better reusability, explainability, and discoverability of contextualized business data in a time-saving way. And um, with this, um, I thank you, but I would also like to, uh, to acknowledge all of the people involved in the project, our data science team, the integrated data management team, collaborators, and our leadership team. And uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Jens, and, and that was a great presentation also from you. So um, right now, I want to thank you both again, uh, Eric and, and Jens, for taking the time, putting those presentations together. I know you also worked closely with Celine and Elizabeth and had s several meetings to, to coordinate this. So we really appreciate your time. I think it's been really useful. We have about 52 participants on the line who've been listening in, and I'm, I'm sure they were able to get a lot of of um, inputs into the work that they're doing. This is a, a broader beyond ontologies community of practice who's listening in. So there may be different uh, levels of understanding, but I think the presentations were very clear and, and again, really great uh, graphs and diagrams for us to, to capture everything and really um, great to see the work that is being done in collaboration, uh, you know, across public private sectors, other research institutes, including the CGIR and, and specifically um, the big data platform and, and of course the ontologies community of practice. So thanks again. As promised, I'm going to open it up now. I'm sure there are many questions and comments for Eric and Jens. So I'll actually hand it over perhaps to Elizabeth first. Um, over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Aman. Thanks, Eric and, uh, and Jens, for those two uh, very informative presentations. So I have uh, two questions for now, and so I'll let you decide who will answer my questions. So you mentioned the, the data cleaning, data quality processes. So I just would like to know more or less what is the proportion between the manual curation uh, of the data sets against uh, automatic curation? Uh, what, what is the, yeah, the load of the manual uh, intervention on that data cleaning and quality uh, checking processes? So, so maybe I will, I will start and, and Eric can uh, accomplish the, uh, the answer. So uh, currently, as we are dealing on one side with historical data, so we are uh, coming close to the numbers Eric mentioned in the slides between 15 and 80 percent. So uh, because the historical data, uh, you have uh, some gaps there, like for instance, um, GPS coordinates are missing. So you have to correct for this and so on. Um, and also the different data sources we are using speaking a different language. So you you have a lot of work to map those data together. And um, this is uh, where currently all the activities goes in uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of time. However, with using the ontology platform and making our data more uh, 
transforming this in more data assets using ontologies, we like to actually reduce this or turn these numbers into into uh, 20 to 30 percent um, of activities in this, but we are not there yet. Just to echo this, I mean, what you what Jens mentioned, perhaps just uh, uh, from the on actual ontology or let's say the terminology aspect, there is there are also like, we also have like a combination of uh, let's say manual and uh, automatic let's say support to to let's say maintain the ontologies and uh, i i i don't have let's say like metrics on exactly how much let's say of, of our time has been going into each one of the let's say particular resources but i will i will just say that both of things are present in what we have in our activities i mean manual curation and, and automatic curation and in particular for the automatic is basically something that is based on certain rules that are introduced so that let's say we could um, identify that uh, early uh, potential let's say duplication of entries i mean from ranging from the very simple types of things that we could discover but there are also we also rely on let's say on the users of what we call our data stewards maybe you remember that i mentioned this this major component about uh, data governance we have people or specialists that are sitting in the business who are the ones that are let's say helping us to to keep a higher quality on the data that we are making use because you know if we continue spreading wrong data or problems yeah, the, the far the downstream uh, there will be issues of course and i think this is also perhaps linked to one of the questions that i can read on the on the chat about let's say the the data integration and the generation of knowledge i'm, I'm trying to to link it to this topic already now uh, because yeah when we went let's say supporting the data integration aspects let's say what what our colleagues were able let's say to do or let's say not directly generate of course that knowledge from this is to let's say based on this enable the generation of new insights so these guys let's say were able to discover which entities were connected to other entities thanks to let's say to this connectivity aspect aspects because in, in at some point in the past let's say systems were just in silos and nobody knew or knew but because you know there are millions of entries sometimes and sometimes just a few of them or hundreds let's say of them and some nobody has in their head how many entries there, there are present but also all the names all the possible codes and these kind of things so by integrating of course we open new doors so that people especially doing data science could provide or come up with insights around it yeah, I understand. Thank you, Eric. I think in the in the academic and public sector, we we are facing the same uh, the same issues. Thank you for your answer. Maria Angelique, would you like to unmute yourself to ask the question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you. Good presentation. And and my question is, how do you deal with uh, ontology update? I mean, is that really like an issue for you in your system? Because I mean, I, I'm asking this question because I heard people say saying that, you know, sometimes they don't want to use ontologies because they are changing all the time. I mean, to me, it seems like good and healthy that an ontology continue to grow. But but yeah. So I'm uh, more on the how do you yeah how do you deal with that specific yeah. it's it's a very good question maria angelique indeed uh, yeah it, this could be as i mentioned in in the slides around maintenance this is one of the topics of the of let's say how often we are going to update ontologies in particular for instance the external ontologies as we call them like the trait ontology the gene ontology etc et we have let's say like defined points in within the year typically four times a year that we are updating those ontologies. In some particular cases, if there is like, like an explicit request of some people because uh, like a, a term that it's not present there and is already present in the public ontology, in that particular case, of course, there will be like a, a fast track or let's say fast update of this ontology so that they could continue doing their job. So that's, there is some, of course, this is just to tell you that there is certain flexibility. So that's uh, that's indeed one point. But also, in we need to be also careful that when we are updating ontologies, we need to see that the data that has been already connected to the to the ontology that we already had in the system is not going to get broken with the new ontology that is coming up to us. So 
of course, we need to, to have certain mechanisms, typically automate, automatic, to check these kind of things. So sometimes we are running like um, tests or so to see whether we are, we are still retrieving the same kind of, uh, let's say, answers to the questions that we predefined it, let's say. Of course, we don't have like a full-fledged uh, uh, battery of tests, like uh, with thousands of queries, but uh, there are relatively a few of them. Uh, that can help us to highlight where the challenges are. And typically our knowledge engineers or the people behind the operational teams know where to look and because they know what's, what typically is changing in these kind of ontologies. Just to give you an example, you know, the gene ontology is also changing every day. Every day there is a release. So, but for, let's say, some, some sort of obvious reasons, we are not updating this, this ontology in our system every day. There are we are only doing four times a year because this is a very rich ontology and it's covering most of our activities by a far extent, let's say. Now, maybe jumping into the maintenance of internal ones. This is, of course, this is of course following a sort of different um, approach. It's indeed, and even internally, there are, let's say, the, depending on the type of resource, whether it has been, let's say, a, syst uh, a data resource that has been coming from a legacy system or a legacy data set, legacy list of codes, maybe they are not going to change that often because those systems are sort, sort of just there because they, we need compatibility or we need to, to make sure that people can still find those codes. So I, I agree with you that perhaps people could be sometimes scared that uh, the, those ontologies, or, I mean, these this kind of things are sometimes constantly changing, but. Uh, one principle that we have, or let's say what we, we try to use to, to make aware of our to our people is that um, these kind of resources, of course, need to evolve because that's also healthy. They need to be constantly uh, improved because they are not perfect. We are constantly adding new entries, new relations, connections here and there, which is also good on one hand, but also they need to know that these things are not changing that often. And it's because the, I think I mentioned at some point, we, we we, we put, let's say, all these kind of resources within a larger box that is called master data. I guess some of you have heard about this concept of master data, or let's say the important business data business entities, let's say, that are relevant, like not only codes, names of species, names of genes. So we try to, of course, propagate the message that these things are there and, let's say, are not as volatile as they believe. I, I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, um, Eric, for, for the answering the question. Over to you, Meda. Thanks. Um, thanks to you both, the speakers, as well as to the organizers. I found this to be a really excellent webinar. Um, so much appreciate that. Um, my question, I have two questions, but I'll, the, the first one re re refers pretty directly to the ontologies and uh, some of the issues that we're facing through the Big Data Platform. I lead the organized module of the Big Data Platform. And one of the things that we're trying to do is, um, or we will have within the, the next month or so, is uh, a test workflow that allows um, easy verification of data and with a focus on the interoperability. Uh, and for that, we're working with uh, the COPO tool that Earlham Institute has developed, um, a part of which is uh, allows uh, the annotation of data sets, data variables really, with ontology concepts. Now, one of the issues that we face there is this problem of multiple ontologies, you know, ontology proliferation, often with uh, common terms or similar terms across ontologies, and it becomes a real hassle uh, in terms of um, being able to pick one. Uh, the other related issue is sometimes you need to sort of specify uh, not just one concept, but one sort of data variable may include multiple concepts that that are needed to describe it well. Um, so how do you how do you do you how do you uh, uh, deal with that kind of problem? Okay, let, let me take the, the question. Um, pretty good point, actually, in terms of let's say how how to make sure that let's say the the the, the cons consumers are not only satisfied but that, that that they also have let's say the appropriate data that they are trying to fish out from these kind of systems so i i guess you you, re you recall this diagram where i was showing the platform and one of the components i think it was showed in green or so was around data governance and i think this is the key to answer this this kind of problematic because the the ontologies are let's say one 
piece of the entire puzzle in the in the sense that uh, this is the content the, uh, the, the you, you you could have let's say a very rich data set or let's say a ontology terminology around the species for instance there you might have for instance a, a, the classical ncba taxonomy which is pretty relevant for the people who are doing uh, I don't know research in the lab, let's say. But if you if you want to talk about the species with other types of of, of people within the with the company, for instance, they don't know anything about this particular taxonomy. I mean, I mean the the NCBI, but they are much more aware of the EPPO taxonomy, which is the the one produced by the European Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization. So both of them are on one hand not totally compatible. There are of course a lot of overlapping. The EPPO one is, let's say, much more focused, of course, on, uh, on plant protection activities and pathogens and these kind of things. The other one is much more broader, and there are, there, there are, you can find many more species. But the point is that there are two different resources. So, which one we have we have to have in the system? The answer in our case was we need to have both, of course, because we have these two types of users and how is this going to be organized how how do we know that they are consuming the appropriate thing there is where it comes the uh, the data governance component and this is this is you know a major topic around that is part of, of uh, the our activities around uh, data management within this activity we have data stewards who are let's say the guys of the one the, that are taking care of of let's say not only the quality the completion on let's say making sure that the policies around the data are followed so these guys are the ones who are going to not only recommend but also connect to the users and make sure that they are consuming the appropriate uh, uh, data sets does this answer your question Meda? yes i think it does thank you um aman should i launch into my next one or hold it yeah go for it Meda. Okay, thanks. Um, so again, uh, I, th I think this might be for both of you, but probably more for you, Eric, uh, or sorry, for, for, well, it could be for both of you. I know that in Jens's presentation, there was a slide uh, showing that field trial pipeline, one of the early slides. Uh, and, uh, and as for like similar for CGIR, it sort of went all the way from scoping through to market. Um, I didn't notice a feedback loop, however, from the sort of the market to back to into the scoping as you sort of, uh, uh, I, I don't know if that's relevant for you or not. It is to a large degree for us, but the, the uh, I guess my question relates to the socioeconomic part of it and, and sort of the variety preferences and, and selections and all of that, which may require some, um, you know, concepts that are, that are not, uh, currently that easily available. I, you know, I know that Suno is attending, Suno Kim is or was attending uh, this, this webinar. She's involved in the uh, larger um, effort through the big data platform of developing a socioeconomic ontology. Do you foresee any use for something like that? Are you already using some things? Um, what is your reaction to that? This is a pretty good question. And I mean, it, it's, uh, it gives also to the point. Normally, we only looking uh, on one side uh, of the of the of the pipeline, but we are also working on this to get really the feedback. And I mean, not only the feedback from the marketing uh, uh, back down uh, um, to the scoping, but also having these smaller feedbacks. So the learning from analytics uh, uh, that you see, I need maybe to measure something else uh, to answer uh, uh, certain questions or to build new data models. That also these kind of information are propagated back. And that maybe for next trial, additional parameters can be measured or, or will be taken into account. So this is really important, and we we are working on. Um, there's uh, um, there's not let's say a kind of out of the box uh, pipeline, uh, uh, automated pipeline concept in place yet, but we are working on this. Okay, great. So just uh, just to keep in mind that uh, we, we already have, as you know, the crop ontology and the agronomy ontology, but the socioeconomic ontology is also in development, and maybe there are there are pieces of that that you could use as well. Thanks. Sounds good. Great. Thank you, Meda. Um, I'm going to now hand it over to Max. If you want to unmute yourself, just let us know um, your full name, your the institute you're representing, and go into your question or comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I thank you for the presentation, even if I went late, so I missed the beginning of it, and uh, perhaps my question was already answered. 
I'm Max Ruff, working at the Alliance Biodiversity SEAT in Montpellier office. I am managing characterization data from uh, MUSA collection worldwide, and uh, we are about to manage also evaluation data. Currently, we are using a shadow database model, and so uh, I'm, I am wondering about the type of schema you are using. Is it something you build on your own or you rely on existing uh, schema model from uh, university or any anyone else? Thank you. I, I can take the part of the, the, let's say the question around the ontologies on let's say the server and let's say the, the schemas as you were pointing out. We are not using shadow or let's say any publicly available the schema or model around this. What we have done is to develop something in-house and it's actually the evolution of uh, of many, many years, as I mentioned, of uh, of experimenting here and there. So, and of course, this, this uh, sort of internal, let's say, modeling is not the result of only our internal ideas. As I mentioned in one of my slides, we take we took a lot of inspiration not only from Shad at some point uh, of, of of course, but mm. of other let's say type of resources that are out there so that we could really do the same. And typically, this is also something that we do when we are let's say integrating a new resource. We also investigate how other uh, people are modeling, for instance, a specific type of things like diseases, for instance, plant disease, diseases or something like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, now we're going to go, thank you, Max, for your question. I'm now going to go back to Elizabeth, who has another question. Um, Elizabeth, if you want to unmute your mic. Thank you, Aman. Yeah, I had uh, other questions, in fact, but the, the one I typed is about um, can the knowledge graph easily expand beyond the large amount of 5.3 billion relations and more uh, than 500,000 trials? Uh, if yes or, or no, uh, what would be the possible issue in performance or complexity? Or so, what, what so, is the potential for expansion? Yes, yes. So, so currently there is uh, there uh, there we don't see any problems as we also have like in the harvest season, uh, new trials coming in. So the, the 500,000 trials will continuously uh, growing. Um, um, I think maybe in the future, um, if you if, if it becomes to more, let's say sensor based measurements, where you where you have much more uh, um, data you have to uh, to deal with. So maybe there we will might be a run in certain uh, in certain limitations or issues which we have to tackle and maybe look for new technologies. Mm -hmm. But so far, looking at these uh, uh, major historical trials, uh, we don't have these issues. So uh, for the future, I might be see some issues uh, coming up with the sensor-based uh, uh, technology. However, there I think also we will uh, get an answer um, in in the direction of graph databases and so on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because with the sensor you will have a, 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 a rather rapid generation of large amount of data and diverse data formats. So it's probably the the performance will will be uh, challenged by this uh, amount of of live data, probably. I I think so. It's also that you might be bring even your data science toolbox to the data. And, and do kind of edge an, uh, analytics and then just pull out what you might be need for further analytics. So mm -hmm. I guess there's maybe a trade-off uh, that you not collect all the data, that you just pre-select what you need. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I have other questions if there is none from somebody else. Okay, I, I had a question about uh, your graph which is of course uh, focusing on the the field trial crop field trial which is really what is of interest uh, for our scientific domain at least for cgir and probably for the partners who are connected how far your your knowledge graph is uh, reusable um, for another corporate uh, uh, knowledge graph. Can can we use it, for example? Uh, is it for, first? Is it accessible for reuse? And if yes, how um, how much can we customize it? 
So I I I think uh, we we can share on the on the on the model part I guess uh, because most of the data will be uh, propriety for the company right yes. yeah so the, the, there is where most likely the limitation is to access uh, those data however to to exchange on the data model um, uh, and so on I think there is no problem mm -hmm. we also have seen in the past that those kind of concept is uh, is quite reusable and also customizable because a similar uh, concept we were using before uh, for the seeds business, um, and we also had a knowledge graph for for the biology. So mm -hmm. it really depends on the domain you are looking into, and uh, you want to actually answer questions. Okay. Okay, so that's good to know. Uh, of course, we could say that the data won't be accessible, but at least, uh, yeah, the model, the graph itself, uh, without the data, of course. Um, and. Uh, I have um, another comment or question. Is um, to summarize a little bit, if we wanted to start a, a knowledge graph like you did, what would be the three top elements to consider first or have in hand before we start? So uh, our learnings on the way is you need a fast a prototyping possibility. Mm -hmm. And and this is where we were using uh, uh, Neo4j as a selected uh, um, uh, uh, toolbox, where of course you will not uh, uh, um, you have the heavy lifting of the of the semantic RDF kind of stuff. You leave in the first place out of the game. You start to define your your data model you want to uh, link your data on, and then you start uh, 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 filling these data model you defined. And with this, you have a quite a, 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 a fast turnover that you can immediately see your results. You can query the uh, um, the graph and so on. And mm -hmm. over the learnings, then if you see it, you come up to a, with a stable data model. Then you turn this and link it to existing ontologies, existing terminologies, and so on, where you then really tie in uh, the heavy semantic stuff. Okay, that's. Very important, I think. And how far, um, yeah, do you need the expertise or a group of experts to help you to build your knowledge graph out of the expert knowledge? Do you I need think them? You def I think you definitely should in contact, and this is what we also have to have interviews and an exchange uh, with the experts in the field. Uh, 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 that you, uh, we also do field visits to to uh, uh, to uh, to discuss with technicians and so on, or the project leads of these kind of things to understand what is the idea behind, and also to shadow them uh, basically uh, what kind of activities uh, they have to do, and then we trans try to translate this and to capture the data. Okay, thank you. So I think we are reaching the end of the time we 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 allocated to the webinar. The only thing before I give um, the floor back to Aman to close, um, Eric had a, a slide with uh, several remarks and questions about the ontology maintenance development, uh, where to submit a new concept, uh, and so our community of practice. I hope can be a resource to help for that. Uh, I know you are both a member of our community of practice, but if there is any ways to formalize more uh, our collaboration, so we can help addressing your, your issues in the use of uh, external ontologies or bringing some of your internal concept into ontologies, then we should have a follow-up discussion around that, I think. But for sure, we can really uh, we have a, a good wealth of experts in the committee of practice and they can help or collaborate. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the comment. Thank you. So, Aman, I let you the floor to, to conclude. <laughs> Sure, yes. So thank you everyone again for connecting. It seemed like we were able to get through the whole webinar without any too many technical difficulties. Um, thank you again to Jens and Eric for joining us and taking the time to prepare the information and answer our questions and comments. Um, thank you also to the team that has been putting these together and continues to put them together, Celine and Elizabeth, on, on coordinating and organizing for today. Um, and just to let you know, um, 
we had mentioned if you go into the beginning of the chat box there's ways to stay connected with this group if you're not already connected through the various channels you'll see listed there and to let you also know that our next webinar will be coming up on the 7th of April if you want to either mark your calendars if you are already receiving the updates and are a part of our newsletter you will receive that in your inbox and you can save that into your agenda books and the the topic will be agronomy ontology and agro fims field book um, and we have some lovely presenters here um, who are also jo who joined us today Marie Angelique Celine and Meda who are preparing a, a really interesting uh, webinar for us. Um, so please come back and, and join us again if you're able to. I'm gonna just pass it back to you uh, for the final um, closing, Elizabeth. And, and thank you again, everyone, for joining. Um, back to Elizabeth. Thank you, Aman. Thank you, Céline, for this organization. And a particular thanks to our speakers, Eric and Jens. They have been really preparing their, uh, their speech for this webinar. Uh, everything has been recorded, so you can go back, uh, listen to it, and please share it. Share it on, on your social networks, because it may be of interest to other uh, person who couldn't attend today. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's really, it was very nice to see uh, such an audience online. And we hope to have you online for the next webinar as well. Uh, thank you for your time. And you can always uh, post some questions and that to me or, uh, or put some comments on the video on YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And so see you next webinar. <laughs>